Hi, welcome to another episode of Tom Kennedy Science, and I'm your host, Dr. Tom Kennedy. Now today, I want to talk about something really exciting, and that is photosynthesis. No, photosynthesis is not chlorophyll sounds like borophyll. Uh, Happy Gilmore, man, you're wrong on that one. This stuff is really exciting. Now, what I want to talk about today is not necessarily the nuts and bolts of how photosynthesis works. That'll be my next video. But what I do want to talk about today is the importance of photosynthesis. I mean, if we go back to over 4 billion years of life on this earth and the history of, of life on this earth, think about like, you know, what is the most amazing evolutionary innovations or some of the most important evolutionary innovations? You know, and at the top of that list, or near the top of it, would almost certainly have to be photosynthesis. I mean, photosynthesis basically just, I mean, paved the way for the way we see the world today. Photosynthesis basically made our current life possible. So what I'm going to talk about is not, you know, how the light reaction works or how the Calvin cycle works, but how photosynthesis changed the world, which I think is really, really amazing. And then the second thing I'm going to talk about are the origins of plants and the origins of chloroplast. Because, as you know, a lot of the photosynthesis that takes place today is done inside the chloroplast. And when we study photosynthesis, we usually study how it works in plants. So at least that's how we learn it. And then interestingly, people are trying to figure out the evolution of photosynthesis studying bacteria. Pretty cool, huh? Okay. So why do we care? You know, um... This is important. The, the book, you know, that we teach from in most textbooks, if you're taking an intro uh, cell and molecular biology class or an intro biology class at a university or even in high school, you know, the books do a pretty good job of the nuts and bolts of like this, how this is how photosynthesis works. And there are lots of places on the Web you can get that. But, you know, I mean, the evolutionary significance of photosynthesis is often overlooked. It's it's like a paragraph or two of like Photosynthesis added oxygen to the atmosphere. Yeah, right. Well, but why is that so important? And some of you are probably going, well, it made animal life possible. And that would be true. But if you go back 4 billion years ago to when life evolved on the planet, there was no molecular oxygen. Now, of course, there was lots of oxygen on the planet. I mean, oxygen was in water, you know, H2O. It was bound up in rocks. It was in carbon dioxide. But... There was no free oxygen. That's O2. That's what we breathe. And if you were to look at Earth, I, I think I used a picture of Mustafar from Star Wars there, you know, where um, Jedi's kind of fall and become Darth Vader. But you think of like the Mustafar system, right? This volcanic planet. And then you look at our Earth today. Our Earth is, I mean, it's been called a pale blue dot. It's been called the blue planet. But our beautiful blue skies and blue oceans has a lot to do with oxygen. And oxygen really cleared uh, the atmosphere out of methane and other, other stuff in there. And it also oxidized a lot of the iron out of the oceans. I mean, our oceans would look like a dirty martini with all the iron in it. But over time, oxygen basically oxidized all that iron out. And we had this beautiful blue-looking planet today. So the modern look that we see... Is because of photosynthesis releasing oxygen into the atmosphere. We don't often think about that. I mean, every mineral that forms on the surface has to react with oxygen. So the Earth's atmosphere hasn't always had it. In fact, during the Hadean, when the Earth formed 4.6 billion years ago, we don't really know exactly what the atmosphere was like, but we can guess it was full of methane, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, water vapor, maybe some ammonia and stuff like that. But that early life had evolved in that. And I love this illustration of like the Hadean earth with all of the meteors landing, hitting it. There were a lot more meteors back then hitting the earth. Um, we were still clearing out our orbit. Uh, the moon was like way closer than it is today. And it would have dominated the night sky. And it's been estimated that tides, you know, the up and down of those sea levels caused by the attraction of the moon, right? Like maybe in some cases a thousand feet because the moon was so much bigger. And uh, we were much more volcanically active. And we're still a fairly volcanically active planet. So life evolved. We, you know, there's, not everybody agrees. It was definitely before 3.5 billion years ago, because at 3.5 billion years ago, we have stromatolites. And these are bacterial colonies. 
So we know life evolved before that. There's uh, good evidence of 3.7 to 3.8 billion years ago. And I say life probably even got started before that, like as early as 4 billion years ago, based on some isotope signatures. So these are stromatolites. They represent bacterial colonies. These are in Shark Bay, Australia. I did not take that photo. I can't wait to get there and take pictures of these. But um, we know that life's been around, and we think that photosynthesis began really early on in life. And that's important, right? So photosynthesis, think about the word. Photo means light. Synth, synthesis means putting together. So what photosynthesis does, these are autotrophs. That means they're self-feeding. Any autotrophic organism, like plants doing photosynthesis or bacteria doing photosynthesis, takes carbon dioxide, which is CO2, which is not an organic form of carbon, and fixes it into organic molecules. And to do that, you've got a, a source of energy. You have to have energy. So sunlight, we have abundant sunlight. And you need a source of electrons and hydrogens to take carbon dioxide and fix it into organic molecules. This is a redox reaction where carbon is going to get oxidized, right? And of course, it's an endergonic reaction, so we need energy. So photosynthesis, the very first types of photosynthesis, of course, they relied on light as their source of energy, but they probably got their hydrogens from other sources like hydrogen sulfide, which is a little bit easier to break down. So this is a, a, a sulfur bacteria. It uses hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is, is common, but it's not the most abundant thing on the planet. And then... We, we're not exactly sure. It could have been 3.5 billion years ago. It could have been 3.2 billion years ago. But what happened is cyanobacteria. Hmm. Prokaryotes evolving new metabolic pathways. That happens all the time, right? Structurally simple, but man, these guys are on the forefront of like molecular innovations. So sometime around 3.5, 3.2 billion years ago, cyanobacteria evolved. And of course, they're green because they have chlorophyll. And that's a pigment that absorbs sunlight. And what they use for their source of electrons is water. Now, this is brilliant, right? I mean, we live on a water world with lots of sunlight. So using water is pretty significant because that's an abundant source. There's only one problem with using water. It's hydrogen bound to an oxygen. Oxygen is the second most electronegative element in the universe, right? So stripping electrons away from oxygen, splitting apart water, requires a lot of energy and some interesting biochemistry. And these green uh, cyanobacteria manage to find a way to split water, to rip electrons away from oxygen. So good job on the cyanobacteria. And then, because they were able to use water, well, if you're stripping electrons away from water, what do you think the byproduct of this is going to be? Oxygen, right? So, <clears throat> you know, at first... Um, well, you and I probably going, oxygen, that's a good thing. But if you were one of these early microbes 3.5 billion years ago and there's this oxygen around, you're like, oh no, this is not good. Because oxygen, I've said this before in my other, in my other videos, oxygen is really, really electronegative. It oxidizes membranes and proteins and your DNA. And when it does that, it can kill cells. So this first amount of oxygen in the atmosphere was pretty rough right? I mean, it was damaging to life. So as you can imagine, life had to evolve to it. And I like this, um, this chart here kind of shows how we think that um, the atmosphere may have changed. Like I said, as, as you go really far back in time, we just don't have a lot of information. But it was certainly we know there was a lot of water vapor, there was a lot more carbon dioxide. I know in today's world, we're like, oh, how come we weren't in a major greenhouse effect back then? And we were. Just that the sun, 4 billion years ago, was only about 75% as bright as it is today. So that extra carbon dioxide and water vapor was actually really good for keeping the planet warmer. Because if we didn't have that, it would be bad. But as you can see, over time, nitrogen stays very abundant in the atmosphere. But uh, carbon dioxide goes down, which is good because the sun continually got warmer over hundreds of millions of years. And then starting about 2.5 billion years ago, what do you see? oxygen levels really started to spike. Now that lag time of like basically no oxygen and the oxygen levels rising could have been, it took a long time for photosynthesis to evolve, which I doubt very seriously. I think most of it is as oxygen was being produced, it was rapidly oxidizing 
minerals on the surface of the planet and in the water, including iron. And it took about a billion years of these cyanobacteria pumping out oxygen to basically oxidize the iron out of the oceans and form our banded iron formations that we actually use today. It's kind of cool to smelt into steel. So today our atmosphere is 22% oxygen. That is the direct result of life, right? We actually have an oxygen imbalance. We actually have a carbon dioxide imbalance on our planet. We have less carbon dioxide and way more oxygen. The reason why is because of photosynthesis. And in fact, as we look for life elsewhere in the universe, a smoking gun of life is an atmosphere full of oxygen, right? Because we know that's created by photosynthesis, which is a biotic process. So yeah, so our blue planet today, this beautiful pale blue dot is a result of a photosynthesis releasing oxygen. But this was also important for other reasons as well. You may have heard about the ozone layer. Okay, the ozone layer is made up of O3 and it's high up in the atmosphere, right? And what happens is ultraviolet light reacts with O2, kind of breaks it up a little bit and forms O3, ozone. Now down here, ozone is really bad because Oh my gosh, it's really reactive. But high up in the atmosphere, ozone protects us from ultraviolet light. So our ozone layer uh, allows animals and plants to live on the surface of the planet. If we didn't have an ozone layer, you wouldn't have all of these amazing amounts of life living on the surface of the planet. It, it'd just be irradiated from ultraviolet light. And this is a little bit more controversial, but I totally buy into it. Ultraviolet light has enough energy to split water into hydrogen gas and oxygen. And if we didn't have an ozone layer over hundreds of millions of years, what would have happened is the ultraviolet light would have split water in our oceans. And eventually um, the hydrogen gas would form. The earth is not large enough to hold on to hydrogen gas, right? So it would just escape into space. And then the remaining oxygen being reactive within a few thousand years would react with minerals on the surface of the planet, we would end up looking like a dry, dead world. This red. Hmm. Mars. Yes, Mars is a dead, dry, oxidized world. And part of the reason is life never had the chance to stabilize the atmosphere of that planet. And it's also a little bit small, too. So it kind of lost its, its atmosphere for various reasons. I'm not going to get into that today. I, I go down those rabbit holes quickly. But the ozone layer, because we have oxygen, helps protect our oceans and protect the life on the surface of the planet so we can actually have terrestrial ecosystems. Now, a lot of you thinking, but oxygen, we breathe oxygen. You're absolutely right. About two billion years ago, one of the most remarkable evolutionary events in the history of life occurred. I know I called evolution one of them, but here's one of the other ones. The evolution of cellular respiration. Cellular respiration allowed cells or, or prokaryotes evolved the ability to use oxygen to make lots of ATP. And it was a way to get rid of the oxygen, right? To protect themselves. And then that aerobically respiring bacteria merged with an archaean. And guess what we got? Eukaryotic cells. And eukaryotes through endosymbiosis was a major, major change. If this never happened, all life on this planet would still be bacteria and archaeans. We'd still be just prokaryotic cells. But the endosymbiosis led to the largest restructuring of cellular cellular structure, I know it says structure twice, in two billion years. And now we have these larger, more complex cells because they have more energy. And what does that lead to? That leads to life. So photosynthesis paved the way for multicellular life. It paved the way for the evolution of animals and plants, and especially animals. We require a lot of oxygen. Oxygen energized life because it just made cellular respiration so much more efficient. And there you go. There's some really cool fish like a Picasso clown, a mola mola, uh, frog fish. And man, I forgot the bottom right, barrel eye fish. Yeah, if you look closely, those are its eyes. And instead of looking forward like yours and mine, it's looking straight up. That's why the top of the head is translucent. I love talking about these things in general vertebrate zoology. And of course, believe it or not, oxygen paved the way for plants too, right? Because plants acquired their chloroplast from cyanobacteria. No plant ever evolved photosynthesis. 
just like no animal ever evolved cellular respiration. I know, it's pretty cool, isn't it? And these are some of the plants. And, you know, plants today are multicellular organisms, and they release a lot of oxygen into our atmosphere, along with uh, um, algae in our oceans and our lakes and rivers. And, of course, you can see photosynthesis. It helps maintain this carbon balance on our planet. It helps maintain oxygen as well. And uh, you can see the different rates of oxygen or photosynthesis on the planet. And you notice it's kind of low, way out in the middle of the oceans. Plenty of sunlight, plenty of water. They're just really nutrient limited. And, of course, the Sahara, totally water limited. So you need light, you need water, and you need nutrients for photosynthesis to occur. Okay, so plants, cyanobacteria, algae, these are all autotrophs. And they're also called producers. And every autotroph takes carbon dioxide and fixes it into an organic molecule. And like I said, you need a source of electrons and hydrogens to do that, and you need a source of energy. And of course, plants, they get their energy from the sunlight, and they get their hydrogens and electrons from water. So, man, isn't that amazing? Look at this. Uh, photosynthesis paved the way for multicellular life, stabilizes our atmosphere, protects our oceans, life on the surface, and this is a cloud rainforest from Costa Rica. And uh, man, this place was beautiful. It was Ceredontis. We were up there looking for lizards and other amphibians and reptiles. And uh, this cloud forest would not exist if we didn't have an ozone layer protecting us from ultraviolet light. So way to go, photosynthesis. And uh, the origin of plants, really quickly. You know, I always say that primary endosymbiosis was the evolution of eukaryotes in general. That was not done by phagocytosis, where one cell engulfs another cell. However, plants are eukaryotic cells just like animal cells. And eukaryotes are much larger, more complex. You can pack them full of mitochondria to make lots of ATP. They have an advanced cytoskeleton made up of microtubules and actin filaments, keratin fibers too. They are capable of phagocytosis. So about a billion years ago, there was a, another endosymbiotic event where a eukaryotic cell phagocytized some cyanobacteria. And those cyanobacteria, guess what? They evolved into chloroplasts. So plants actually have two endosymbionts. They have the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. Now, of course, in today's world, they're it's hard to call them an endosymbiont anymore. They are no longer free living organisms. Most of their DNA has actually migrated to the nuclear DNA of these organisms. So they're completely dependent on the host cell now. And then uh, that endosymbiotic event probably occurred before a billion years ago in reality. Because we think that the first green algae that was becoming multicellular occurred about a billion years ago. And um, that's pretty awesome. Uh, we think it was 700 to 800 million years ago. But we, we we're pushing that back to potentially a billion years ago. That's 500 million years before dinosaurs, right? And when we start getting this filamentous algae like you see on this picture, that was huge. Because now we're starting to increase the rate of photosynthesis. By increasing the rate of photosynthesis, we're pumping more oxygen into the atmosphere. That paves a way for, multi, for larger animals to evolve, or animals to evolve in general. And you're creating habitat. You're creating structural complexity in these ecosystems. And you're making more nutrients available to life. So big deal. And of course, inside of plants, you have the chloroplasts. And these chloroplasts were once free living bacteria or cyanobacteria to be specific. And you can pack chloroplasts, thousands of them into a single cell within a, within a leaf. Okay, so my next video is going to be on how these green pigments work. Okay, well this has been another episode of Tom Kennedy Science.